Hello, my name is Julie McCrossan and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third of our debates here on Médecins Sans Frontières TV, MSF TV. Each week we're looking at a major issue around the world for very vulnerable people. And today perhaps the most vulnerable of all, refugees. We're going to look at key issues for refugees, key needs and what needs to be done. And I've got four men here who are passionately involved in supporting refugees. It's my great pleasure to begin by welcoming Ivan Gayton. He's the head of mission for Médecins Sans Frontières in Nigeria, and he's come from Nigeria to be with us today, which is amazing. And Ivan is a member of MSF International Working Group on Migration, so welcome to you. I should say that Ivan is the primary author of Torture, Exploitation, and abuse of migrants in North Africa, and we'd like to talk to you about that report. Welcome also to Riz Wakil. He's a refugee from Afghanistan who spent 11 days at sea, eight months in detention in Australia, in Curtin, in Western Australia, has been granted asylum and is now running, I'm glad to say, a printing business in Western Sydney. So welcome to you. Welcome also to Tim O'Connor from UNICEF. He's a lawyer by background and he's spent 15 years on human rights issues. Welcome, Tim. And finally, Mark Chaucevere, who's coordinator of clinical services at Starts, which is a service for the treatment and rehabilitation of torture and trauma survivors. And Mark's a clinical psychologist working with individuals. So guys, welcome to you all. I, I guess I want to kick off. There, there's so many things we could talk about when we're talking about refugees. I'll just ask each of you to think of one or two of the most critical issues and what needs to be done to improve the lives of these people. Tim, from UNICEF, we want to focus on the most vulnerable, so let's start with children. What are the key issues for kids? I think um, children are absolutely one of the most vulnerable groups, but refugees themselves are vulnerable by their very nature, by the fact that they, they seek asylum, you know, often under very extreme uh, issues. You know, I'm sure we'll discuss some of those today. But I think one of the key things to remember, particularly in Australia, is that refugees are people as well. Mm. We get caught up in a lot of the language, they're boat people, and it's very much about the other. Uh, refugees are brothers and sisters and cousins and mums and dads, just like we have here in Australia. And I think that's a, that's a really crucial thing to, to think about in terms of framing the debate. In terms of working with children, I guess the thing that UNICEF would really like to see is a, a, a recognition that children are vulnerable, absolutely. But beyond that... What does vulnerable mean? It, it, absolutely. That's one of the key things. It can just become a catchphrase. So it's really understanding some of those specific vulnerabilities. So, um, you know, children, young children under five, for instance, um, they need specific care and attention and love, uh, but they also need, you know, uh, appropriate medicines, um, specific nutrition, uh, whereas adolescents have different care needs as well. And also the situations that a refugee may come from can really affect the, the sort of response that organisations like UNICEF need to have as well. Uh, someone fleeing a conflict is very different to someone who may be coming from a natural disaster. So we need to take a very specific approach to each individual and each, each case. I guess on this program we're, we're always trying to say what's being done that's working well for these vulnerable people, but what more needs to be done? Many of these children spend months or years in detention or camps. What can you do while they're there so they've got a chance of a life and a job when they finally get out? Again, and it's a very diff different situation. Someone who's an immediate refugee, for instance, some of the people f who may be fleeing um, the situation in Syria at the moment. The needs of them when they arrive in you know, one of the neighbouring countries are vastly different to someone who may be uh, in Somalia as an internally displaced person who's been there for you know since the start of the Civil War 20 years ago. But all kids need school. Absolutely. School? That's a fundamental thing. And I think one of the great... Uh, successes over the last decade or so has been the establishment of um, temporary learning centres where kids uh, when they arrive are appropriately assessed and assessment is a really crucial issue but they're appropriately assessed and they're quickly moved into these temporary learning centres where they can begin to establish a routine because a routine is one of the crucial things in terms of beginning to manage um, trauma for children. Look, let me come uh, to Ivan Gate and Head of Mission for Médecins Sans Frontières in Nigeria the news is full of the disturbances in North Africa and one has a sense that places like Italy and Tunisia, Lampedusa, is that the name of the island? It is. Uh, uh, that there is extraordinary stress as people are heading up from North Africa towards Europe. What are some of the key issues Médecins Sans Frontières is dealing with? Well, the concern that I've been having for the last couple of years is really when we're going to do this offshore processing as a world community, as a humanitarian community, we need to ensure that there's some controls in place. If people are going to subcontract or do this offshore processing of people who want to claim asylum, it's really important 
that they actually have some controls in place to ensure they don't turn into nightmares of torture and abuse. Explain to me what you mean by offshore processing with some examples and then the sort of controls that you think would help. Well, for example, just prior to the Arab Spring, Italy made some deals with Libya to capture, detain, and deter migrants. And by deterrence, we have to think for a moment that this means convincing someone from Somalia that they're better off in Mogadishu than trying to get to Italy and get a job. So that deterrence has to be pretty strong. And what it really turned into in Libya was deliberate, savage torture. Thousands and thousands of people were tortured and ill-treated in detention centers that were funded ultimately by the European Union. And I encountered hundreds of those people myself personally in Tunisia as they fled the Libyan conflict. Mm. And that really led me to, to, to this realization that this offshore processing, when, when one country, a wealthy country, pays a poorer country, which may or may not have any controls or, or any legal framework for, re for recognizing the rights and, and obligations around refugees, it can really turn bad. Obviously, this is a very hot issue here in Australia. You mention rights of refugees. There is a right to flee. In essence, what is that right and, and on what is that right based? Well, in fact, Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says any person has a right of exit of any country, including his or her own. There's no corresponding right there, uh, on the other hand, of entry anywhere else. If, for example, Somalia doesn't meet your needs as a human being, you have the right to go to international waters or Antarctica. So, in fact, if you're trying to get to somewhere where you can find some assistance, there are a lot of barriers in place. It's one of the funny contradictions of international law that since we can't send one back to Somalia, we're not allowed to refoule or send someone back to Somalia against their will, we actually then, because we're stuck with a Somali once they manage to make landfall in a wealthy country, we put all kinds of barriers in place to make sure that they never get to even exercise that right in the first place. And that's the terrible paradox of the world today. In some ways, the more we recognize that where you're coming from is so bad that we cannot even in good conscience send you back there, the more we attempt to ensure that you don't ever even get the chance to exercise that right to claim asylum. Okay. I, my understanding is another key issue from the point of view of Médecins Sans Frontières is where people have managed to get to another country and are in some sort of detention or camp. Access to those camps is critical. Can you give me examples of places that you've been and, and what the problems are with access and why access is important? Well, it's important for independent humanitarian actors to be able to get in, first of all, to help people. First and foremost, we exist to provide assistance. And the people um, um, who need psychological and psychiatric assistance, medical care, it's really important that they be allowed to access it. And, and sometimes you cannot rely upon the people whose primary job is to detain people to provide all of these services. So that's important to allow, to allow service provision in. But it's also really important for people to know that there are the eyes of the world watching. You cannot allow people to languish for years in places where the only people they come in contact with are effectively their jailers. And so I would say that access for independent humanitarian actors into detention centers is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. and, and that should be in place for every single migration detention center on this planet. Now, opinion. Ivan, you've had a chance to actually visit places. So I just want to get an example, one or two examples of camps or detention centres you've entered and what you see there that concerns you because we want to focus on the most vulnerable refugees. In Evros, Greece, just across the Evros River from Turkey, I was in a migrant detention centre where one of the rooms was about 75 square metres and it had 157 men in it with one toilet and one sink, no shower. They didn't have shampoo, they didn't have a change of clothes, they were never ever allowed outside and they were in there for six months. And the MSF psychologist who worked there said, this is not active torture, but it's passive torture. Mm. I saw a Burundian man in there who spent his entire day screaming and whacking his hands against his head. He was completely psychotic. The police did not know what to do. We actually wound up providing psychological care to the police in that centre because what they were being forced to do was so gruesome. An example, now, though, of the impartiality and independence of MSF, if I might say. I'd say so, yes. I was very proud that our team, yeah. on their own, actually came to the realization that they, they had to treat the police yeah. for the trauma they were undergoing. Um, and I saw that this was actually in the European Union, in Greece, and, and backed by the rest of the European Union. And I thought, well, it must be worse in these offshore detention centers in places like Libya. But even then, I had no idea. When the Arab Spring happened and the walls around Libya fell down, 
and all of the people who'd been in these migrant detention centers funded by Italy and the European Union. And I heard the stories firsthand of the people who'd lived in these places. Even I, who knew it was going to be bad, I was blown away by the savagery that had been visited upon these people. The beatings, the torture, the death. And who was responsible? Who was running the place? The Libyan authorities were running the place, at the behest of the Italians, on behalf of the entire European Union. Okay, so this is why you're so opposed to the, the sort of, it's almost, how would you describe it, the funding of others to do the care of refugees. You just think that's a problem. Without oversight, it's a problem. Effectively, you create a class of people who have no recourse whatsoever. What are you going to do as a Somali in a Libyan detention centre? Call the Somalian embassy? Call the Italian embassy? So you're completely at the mercy of a country that's never signed the 1951 Refugee Convention, like Malaysia, for example, another place where there's discussion of offshore processing, hasn't signed the 1951 Refugee Convention, and I've heard talk of sending unaccompanied minors to, the, no. to that place. Now, as soon as you create that class of people with no recourse whatsoever, it's not a question of whether there will be ill treatment, it's just a question of what form it will take. Uh, I'm going to come to unaccompanied minors in a moment with mm. Tim from UNICEF, but I want to bring Rizwa Kilin, a refugee from Afghanistan. Just before I ask you a little bit about your own story and the lessons you've learned uh, for those of us trying to improve uh, the lives of refugees, any comment on what you've heard so far? What are you thinking as you listen to these gentlemen? You see, the most um, disturbing thing is that, uh, that our government, unfortunately, has decided to um, uh, send people uh, away, punish people, and act like a uh, police from a third world country, where if, if they can't get to the uh, offender himself, they will go and they um, torture and, and, and abuse their family in order to um, encourage or discourage or to, in order to capture the, 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 the guy himself. Now, our uh, uh, government, unfortunately, is trying to punish vulnerable people who put their life uh, on risk, who put their family's life on risk, they, they, people uh, on the other, on other, other side uh, take advantage of their vulnerable situation, take their life saving. They come by boat to our country and what we do, we send them to these processing centers and where they will um, be detained for, um, I don't know how long, maybe two years, three years. And, and now it, it, it's very disturbing that uh, the, our government has decided to do that. And, and Riz, I, I, just to be absolutely clear, when you say our government, you're talking about Australia. You're, in, you're here in Australia I'm, now. I'm a proud Australian yeah. citizen now, and, and, and it, it's, it's, it's very disturbing for me. Uh, I came to this country as a refugee. I spent myself uh, a nine months in Curtin Detention Centre, and I saw their people sewing their lips together, and uh, that affected me as a, as, a, as a young adult myself. And just imagine... How uh, old were you when you were in I Curtin? I was 18 when I, when okay. I was in Curtin Detention Centre. Why... Is it possible, as someone who's been in Curtin, I think, for eight months, what is it that drives people to self-harm? Because that's something being discussed in our media, even as we speak today. You see, the thing is, uh, um, people like myself, uh, we think uh, that when we get out of the uh, troubled part of the world countries like uh, um, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, uh, Iraq and now uh, Syria and uh, other troubled part of the world, we think that when once we get uh, to uh, um, like Western world or Western country, people know our problem because um, they are they're sending their troops to Afghanistan and countries like Afghanistan and Iraq. We uh, take it as granted that people uh, in, this, in this part of the world, they, they understand our problem. They will welcome us. They will help us rebuild a life of safety mm -hmm. and freedom in this country. Mm -hmm. But a majority of people, when they find themselves in detention and with, with no um, guarantee how long it will take, for example, if, if a guy goes into prison, he knows that he is there for a, a, a period of time. But in, in most cases, these people, they don't know what's going to happen at the end of the day. Will they will be granted a, a protection visa or not? And uh, that's uh, that's a very difficult situation and, for And Riz, when you were on the boat coming from Afghanistan, where did your boat come from? Uh, from Indonesia. So explain to people, why do you think you've got a right to get yourself to Indonesia and then to come here? You know, some people say, well, why not stay in Indonesia? You see, the thing is, um, um, I'm from Afghanistan. 
to leave Afghanistan, you have to go to the neighboring countries, to such as Pakistan, uh, Tajikistan, or Iran itself. There are millions of uh, refugees in, 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 Ira in Pakistan and in Iran. The, the problem is that there is no processing center. Like I, um, like I've, I was called a queue jumper, I was called uh, a, like a, a, bo a board person. The problem is that a majority of uh, people here in Australia, they don't know that this so-called queue does not exist. So what they would say to you, many would say, why didn't you go through the proper channels? What would you say to that? The thing is, as I said, the proper channel does not exist. And in, in, in third world countries like Pakistan and Iran, to, to, to go to other authority and ac have access there, you have to pay huge bribe. You don't belong to that country, you don't belong to that society, you don't belong to that community, mm -hmm. and you are singled out. They know, and you have to, uh, you have, to have a lot of money to get access to these um, so-called queues and, and processing centers. Like, for example, uh, Julia Gillard, uh, I'm not sure if it was 2009 or 2010, she um, uh, processed more than 500 asylum seekers from mainland Indonesia, and she um, they were granted visa, and they came uh, to Australia. After that, being from a refugee community myself, I knew that people stopped looking for a people smuggler to get on a board. People were hopeful that now that there is a proper channel, we can wait in Indonesia, our application will be processed, we don't have to risk our life, we don't have to pay our life saving to someone to go to Australia. But the thing is that that was a, a once-off, and I don't know what was the reason. The, uh, the, our government, shamefully, did not exercise the same thing again. Uh, Riz, can I ask you, where is the rest of your family? You've still got family in Pakistan, haven't you? In my family is in Pakistan. My dad passed away. Uh, my mum is living with, uh, with my brother and my sister. And as, as we all know, um, uh, uh, Quetta, in, 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 in Pakistan is uh, at the moment is more a dangerous place to live for, for Hazaras like myself r rather than somewhere in mainland Afghanistan. And how hard would it be for your family to join you here? It's almost impossible. I tried myself all legal um, avenues to bring them here and, and that's again one of the reasons why people encourage their family members to, to, to catch a boat because they try to sponsor them on humanitarian, on family re re reunion visa or whatever the process is. But the thing is, they don't get the visa, they don't get the chance for family reunion and, and that's again pushes people to encourage their loved ones to take exactly the same dangerous journey that we did 12 years ago. I, I want to come now, thank you so much Riz, for, for that passionate advocacy and, and explanation. Uh, I'd like to come to Mark Chaucevier from Starts. Just remind us again what STARTS does and, and give us a sense of the people you're working with as a clinical psychologist. Okay. Well, STARTS is the service for the treatment and rehabilitation of torture and trauma survivors. So it's a, a service that works with people from uh, refugee backgrounds or refugee-like backgrounds because sometimes we see people who may have come in other ways. We certainly work with asylum seekers, but they're all people that have suffered trauma in the context of organised political violence. And we're wanting to focus on the most vulnerable. Can you give us a sense of some of the most vulnerable refugees that you've met and the sort of help you're trying to give them? Well, it's, yeah, many, many of the people we've seen are, are very vulnerable, I know, and that's perhaps... The, it's it such an easy word to roll off the tongue, yeah. isn't it? But I guess, you, do you work with children? I work with children. So tell so, us about the so, children you work so with. So certainly children are particularly vulnerable because they're, in, you know, for a number of reasons. I mean, they're particularly uh, dependent on, on carers, on their parents often, or other people who are caring for them. So that makes them very vulnerable when, when for example, the adults have, have got their own traumas and, or the yeah. adults are, are absent because of uh, political violence. So children are, are particularly vulnerable. Some of the um, unaccompanied minors are, are very vulnerable. They're very frightened and worried about people that are back home because they've come alone. They're, they're much more at risk of abuse. Um, so, so what problems do they come to your service with and, and how do you try to help them? Well, the, the problems are not... Uh, I mean, they're different, but there are also similarities with uh, with older refugees as well, with adults. And so there's one of the core difficulties that people have when they've suffered trauma is that, that they tend to relive the trauma in various ways. So mm. people have things like flashbacks um, and um, they, they relive in some sense the, the, the trauma that they've previously experienced. Sometimes this is triggered by... Um, uh, loud noises might trigger gun sh uh, a memory of a gunshot wound. Mm. Uh, children can also experience those kinds of things. They they tend to 
uh, things tend to be acted out more in play, for example, rather than perhaps spoken about or perhaps uh, remembered in the same way as adults could, remember. Could you give us uh, some examples of the sort of play that would make you think this child is having some difficulties? Well, I, th I, th I think when play becomes very uh, stuck, it's not, it doesn't have a kind of narrative uh, flow to it. Uh, it becomes very repetitive and compulsive. Children keep acting out the same scenes. That might be a, someone killing someone and that just goes on and on and there's no, there's no resolution of it, if you like. H have you had any direct experience of people who've been in long-term mandatory detention? Because there's so much discussion about the mental health implications of, of mandatory detention. Yeah. I was listening to Reason. It's 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 very sad, but it's it's very interesting um, that we've we've worked with many people um, who've, who've been in long term detention, um, and, why, and one of the most profound um, well, it's a thought that was going through my head while I was listening to Riz, but it's just that that level of hopelessness that mm -hmm. develops. That that I've I've had people say to me that they've they've they come they've come all the way to Australia. They've they've been through experiences of torture and, and suffering. They may have even lost people that were close to them. But the most difficult thing is to to arrive somewhere where you have that you had this hope that at last you were going to be heard. That at last someone is going to recognise what you've been through and instead of that a, a door is shut uh, you're told that uh, you know you, you, your story is not credible um, and, th and that is a very profound thing I mean we, you know. I might come to mm -hmm. Tim again from from UNICEF again we're trying to focus today on the most vulnerable refugees mm -hmm. and so I want to come back to children what is UNICEF saying to the governments of the world about their obligations to children and what they need to be doing to assist children. And I guess the often the women and sometimes men who are with them, their, their parents. Absolutely. Well, UNICEF works focused on the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which is focused on a lot of areas about fundamental rights, education, health, you know, the things that we take for granted. Protection is obviously a crucial one. Consultation is one of the real challenges. How you get kids actively involved, which is crucial to managing some of the trauma, but how you get them involved in, um, you know, if they're in a refugee camp or, you know, as they're in transition from, from one country to another or a third country. That, that is a key issue. One of the key concerns we have at the moment with the changes that have been made to Australian law is around this issue of guardianship. Um, so can you explain what sure. it is and what the issue is? At the, at the, as the, the legislation used to stand, the Minister for Immigration was also the guardian of children who arrived here unaccompanied. Um, and we saw a conflict in that and we raised it with the Minister and we understood they were doing things to try and sort that situation out. That hasn't happened. And what we see now is with the new legislation amendments that came through in August, is that these children who arrived in Australia unaccompanied, who now potentially be sent to Nauru, will have no guardian. We understand there's not provision of law. Um, and how does that make them more vulnerable, that, that legal reality? Which basically like the, you know, if this is true and it's found to be the case in, you know, obviously there's a lot of organisations looking at this, so it, it's it's not clear as yet, but it's something I think that's likely to be tested. But it basically means that the, the immigration minister is, is kicking these, these kids into the sea in a way, which is a massive concern to an organisation like UNICEF and, and should be a concern to every single Australian. In a way, Ivan, it comes back to your concern about this uh, offshore processing, as it's called here in Australia, and what happens legally to people. In some of my reading before today, uh, I, I heard a quote, we need to look beyond the legal status of people to the human need. And I was, it made me think about how much of the discussion is about the exact legal status of the individuals rather than the human needs that they have. What are your thoughts on what needs to happen for children, the most vulnerable children? The most vulnerable person in the world is the person without any recourse. If there's no legal framework that provides that person with rights, some consistent framework of, of rights and obligations, then that person's vulnerability is effectively 100%. Can you think of a more vulnerable person than a child without a guardian in a third country where there's no real legal framework mm. allowing them a set of consistent rights that they can access? Now, again, a person in that situation most of the time it's not even a question of when or if something bad will happen, it's just a question of what exactly it will be, what form it will take. Mm. It's just a recipe for, for horrifying events. I, I want to get some sense from you and, and anyone else who'd like to offer it, of what is the legal obligation of a nation in this situation? Because you, you read about refugee law, international humanitarian law, human rights law. There's a whole lot of lawyers trying to get a legal framework, but is it possible to sum up what are the obligations of a country when an asylum seeker, a refugee, comes to their shore? What would you say? Well, I'm not a, an expert in refugee law, but it's clear to me that the, the primary obligation is a genuine right to claim asylum. If someone 
has a genuine claim to, to have suffered persecution, then the receiving nation has an absolutely in, uh, unalienable right, mm -hmm. the person who comes has an inalienable right, to be heard. And to be sent away and not to be heard is, is just a complete violation of that. And so that. My understanding is that the heart of, of the Refugee Convention is protection and assistance. That, that it's some, Did you have a sense of it when you were getting on the boat and heading into open ocean, what you thought your rights were? Uh, not, not at all. Uh, uh, the thing is that uh, I was 18. I was uh, my my dad decided for me to get to safety, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't planned for me to come to Australia. Luckily, I'm one of the luckiest people who who who, are, who eventually got to Australia. My trip was organised to go to um, somewhere in you in Europe. My f family friends they live there, and I think my dad was advised to organise a trip so I can get to Europe, uh, any European country. Maybe the good luck was Australia. So. Yeah, <laughs> um, um, I'm proud to be an Australian today, and I think when we when we got out of the boat in in Broome in Western Australia, and from Broome we were taken to to uh, Curtin Detention Centre, uh, we were told that uh, our application will be processed in 45 days. In my personal case, it took more than eight months, and um, um, people from from the same boat, they were in detention for more than two and a half years. The thing is that when we got there, like um, I was uh, a young adult myself, there were ch children um, uh, in, in, in the same boat, there were Iraqi families with their kids in the same boat. Uh, um, like um, I think because I was a mine, like I was an, I was a young adult myself. I was treated very well, and uh, um, I didn't know uh, what was the Australian law under what uh, circumstances we will be in detention centre. Uh, but the thing is, long term detention and the uh, period of time I spent, I think it 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 made a f huge impact in in in, in, in like uh, on my like situation in detention centre. And Riz. Uh, my understanding is that you think young men, young boys in particular, are very vulnerable individuals once you get out. Give us a sense of what happens the day that you get out the gate. What sort of help were you offered? Uh, I, I was released in the community on a temporary protection visa at that time uh, in August 2000. Um, uh, we were sent to a, uh, a backpack accommodation uh, in, uh, we, Perth? in Perth. We were, uh, we were told that uh, the accommodation was paid for for seven days. And we were given, uh, if I'm not uh, wrong in my memory, uh, uh, helps me, uh, for $240 at the end of that, those seven days. And we were uh, told that um, we should look after ourselves. So what did you do? Um, uh, I tried to look for an um, uh, um, Afghan community organization or local community organization in, in Perth. I, c I couldn't find any assistance from, from them. Then I uh, rang um, uh, my uh, colleagues from detention center who got their visas couple of months before I got my one. They were living in Sydney. So I rang them, I approached them. They, they booked my ticket because I didn't have any enough money. Okay. Then uh, I came and joined them in Sydney okay. and they helped me. So and peer support is effectively what helped you. Gentlemen, I have only a few minutes left and there's one other major issue I want to look at because in all the uh, reading I've done around refugees and the most vulnerable, again and again sexual violence came up towards women and children but also towards men and boys in some circumstances. Ivan, I'll come to you, the head of mission with Metson Frontier in Nigeria, because I know you've focused a huge amount on those peoples that are heading up through the top of Africa, desperate for a place to live and work in Europe. What is the story with sexual violence? It, it, it's quite massive, isn't it? It is absolutely endemic. I myself met a woman who had just come out of the detention center circuit in Libya. And once she was in detention, the, the, the operators of the detention center decided to use her to raise more revenue for themselves. So she was gang raped by 10 men every day for three months. She came out, she was completely catatonic. I couldn't go near her because she would start screaming because I was a man. We had to get her to a hospital. We, we tried to get her in the car and she freaked out because it was a, a similar car to the one that she'd been transported between rape houses. We had to change cars and get a female doctor, a good friend and colleague of mine, to take her then to the hospital, which was guarded by a Tunisian military who looked exactly like the people who had perpetrated this. Uh, it was a horrifying experience. Uh, can you give us some sense? I know you are, uh, are on the Medsos of Frontier International Working Group on Migration, so you get to think about and understand issues across the globe. What sort of proportions of women, and, and in some cases children, are experiencing sexual assault? 
Are we talking 40, 50 percent, or 10 percent, 90 percent? What are we? It's very. I'd high. I'd go closer to 90. Mm -hmm. As I said, it's virtually endemic. It's virtually everyone who gets into that system, whether it be the Guatemalans who are crossing the United States toward uh, northern Mexico to try to cross the U.S. border, whether it's people crossing the Sahara Desert on their way up to, to Morocco or to Libya to take a boat to Lampedusa or through even Somalia to, uh, to get across to Yemen and then into Europe. The people coming from Eastern Europe across Turkey, yeah. the people coming from, from Afghanistan and Pakistan trying to get into the European Union, the people waiting in places like Malaysia where there are hundreds of thousands of people awaiting asylum, it's almost universal. Sexual violence is everywhere. Uh, Tim, your thoughts? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's one of the issues that's Im almost impossible to quantify because of the, the movements of people and how it's often done in a very kind of non-transparent manner. But it's very, very difficult to quantify, but it's very high. We absolutely know that. There's so many, so many people, not just women and children, uh, but, but also boys and, and men as well. Look, I, I, I'm, I have to say that in my reading before today, I actually began to cry when I read some of the material I was given on this topic. It, it was so overwhelming. Mm. I'm acutely aware I'm sitting on a panel with four guys who are passionate about this issue, but it is a disturbing aspect of predominantly male behaviour. Mm. Do we have some thoughts on what can be done, on, on changes? I mean, you're working mainly at the individual level, yeah, aren't you, Mark? I was just going to add, I mean, one of the difficulties, of course, is not only is there the, the violence that the individual women suffer and, and other people that are, uh, where, who, who are victims of sexual violence, mm. but it's, it's such a pernicious thing because there's such a stigma mm. around sexual violence. And, and, in fact, it's sometimes used as, as a weapon of war for precisely that reason, because it undermines the, the fabric of, of community. So that what we've found in working with women uh, at starts is that sometimes... Um, those women are, are marginalised from the communities here that, that that could have been so important for the for the kind of recovery they could achieve. So, it's I guess in terms of answering your question, it's about finding strategies to try and build some level of support and and always to keep in mind that people need it's not just an individual a clinical issue but one where they, they're going to need to develop uh, organizations that can support women women are going to need to develop networks of, of, of support in various ways it also obviously has health implications at, at times mm. of childbirth and, and, and mm. in many mm. other ways mm. uh, any thoughts uh, uh, gentlemen on what could be done is it is it about the responsibility of the local home government to have a police force and a security system that is assisting individuals. Your thoughts as someone obviously who knows many refugees. The thing is, I think the best way is to um, end mandatory detention. Uh, I think people living at the moment on bridging visas in, in the community, it's, it's, it's uh, less burden on our economy, on taxpayers' money. People help themselves when once they are in the community among their own people. Like it's it's it's. I think that's the best way to treat people. We, uh, uh, forget about this uh, cruel and very expensive exercise, which is Pacific Solution. Um, I think the best way we can uh, um, help these people is to bring them in the community, let them go with the people they are most comfortable with. Could I ask you, Ivan? You were a co-author of Torture, Exploitation, and Abuse of Migrants in North Africa. So you've looked at this systemically, uh, I I any thoughts on how the rate of sexual assault can be reduced for women and children on the move? Because that's what we've got, people on the move. First of all, provide that legitimate avenue for people to, to, to ask for asylum. Mm -hmm. Secondly, first, I, I certainly agree with Riz on his solution, let's let people integrate via their communities and let's use those communities which already exist. But if we must, do practices like detention and certainly offshore processing, let's ensure that there are no abuses within that system mm -hmm. and thereby really call upon all the governments who want to practice this kind of policy to allow independent humanitarian access mm -hmm. into these places so that we can take a look. And, and I would say to all of the governments that want to practice this kind of thing, if you have nothing to hide in your detention centers, then you have absolutely nothing to fear by allowing independent humanitarian organizations to provide assistance to the people within them. Independent access by humanitarian organisations, would that be our key final message? Absolutely. Uh, independent access and oversight is crucial. I mean, it's, it's one of the key steps in being able to, you know, to, to stop this practice occurring. It's, it's and access to people like you, Mark, with the skills to assist people who've experienced this trauma. Because we began with Tim saying, these are people, these are individuals, mm -hmm. and that's, that's your work in essence, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, and it, and it is about extending uh, these kinds of services wherever they're needed, and and to have a and to, again, I'd emphasise to have a, a 
a focus that extends to looking at community support because it's never just individuals that are damaged by by all these these political violence and, and traumatic events it's it's families and communities as well Look, gentlemen, on behalf of everyone watching, I want to thank you for your contribution. Uh, we will be talking next week about armed conflict, and if you have questions or comments, hashtag MSFTV is the place to do it. Of course, go to the Facebook page. My name's Julie McCross, and it's been fantastic to have these men with us, and we look forward to your contact next week. Bye-bye.